team, um, and he's the first ever new veteran. So Brandon Rosenhaus, I see his favorite college podcast. Uh, he talks like this, talking to the artists, talking to the artists, and we're extremely proud and happy and excited to have you here today. So uh, before I move along and give the conversation to them, I just like to invite y'all to the social hour and ask them where we're having a really good cocktail. <laughs> Inspired by this incredible people in the team. And then also, I wanted to mention that everything is going to be on the So, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I wanted to start the conversation just by asking Adela to tell us a little bit how she came to the medium of light, because she and I were talking a bit before this conversation, and some of you that even might know her and have known her work for a long time, I think it's a really good story, and it really kind of lends itself as to uh, helping explain why Adela has such an interesting and such an innovative approach to the medium. So to kind of set it up, uh, Adela was attending UH for her undergrad and it came around time for the BFA thesis show <laughs> and... So I, I was in my studio working in the painting program. Uh, I was doing sculptures and I was painting them with acrylic paints and uh, the theme at that point was uh, my uh, experience was so noble and they were not very happy sculptures uh, but <laughs> uh, for the show for the senior show i also started to work with light and we were supposed to have two installations or two sculptures or presentations for the final one was in the blackboard gallery and one was upstairs in our studio so in my studio on the fourth floor i had a light installation and downstairs the blackboard I had one sculpture select about the size of the one in the corner, a bit more elongated, and that was supposed to be in a corner. When I get to the gallery, the whole corner is gone, everybody's finished, I have, they gave me the staircase. Mm -hmm. And they said that you cannot attach anything because people will trip over it, so good luck. <laughs> so in that moment, I connected with my professors and they said, Whatever you do, you do best. You know, you're okay. Everything was fine. I was like, they didn't want to know what I'm doing. I moved the whole light installation from downstairs in one night, <laughs> from the upstairs downstairs, and the one from it was supposed to be downstairs went upstairs in my studio. So I switched, um, and I created the first actually light installation for Blaffer under the staircase. It was very light. The CFL, all cathod fluorescent light. Um, it, it was not just light physical light, it was also light weight for the space because I was not allowed in a way to do more. And um, lucky enough, um, the curator, curator from Blaffer, Michael Gudry, noticed me and several times told me, you have to apply to Longdale for a solo show. <laughs> so that's where my career started with the Longdale show, The Green Cyberweb, when I also met Anya. And uh, that's the story when the Paint transforms. Actually, the story was moving to light because I didn't talk about transition in my studio. When I was painting with acrylic paint, I was not happy how the paint acted on the surface. And I wanted it, I want to go to the source of everything. And the source is the way we perceive color is to light and the way that it hits the object and it turns to our eyes. Right? So what the source is actually the light itself. But I was studying, I was just finishing my uh, BFA, and I, I realized that to make progress and everything in, in this field, you cannot repeat the history of anything. Uh, and I didn't want to use what was done before, which was neon light. And I moved to the new technologies in the computer industry. Uh, I actually made a computer explode. That was my first session. There were more than one computer. There were about 30 or 40 computers exploding in that room. <laughs> and <laughs> with all the fans and the CCFL and then LED, which is 50 years old right now, the technology, but because of the consumer market, it's getting more power and it's saving energy. Well, that's one of the, one of the things that I really like and appreciate in your work is that you are using light but you're using light in terms of what i see in a new way because you know the history of light or light as art doesn't go back that far in in the terms of art history as a whole but 
it's hard to see any artwork that uses light and not think of Dan Flavin, or not think of James Terrell, or not think of people that have kind of initially pioneered the medium. And I think what you're doing in terms of the different kinds of light and the adaptations of new technologies is really kind of bringing it into the 21st century in a way that none of the uh, 20th century works. They all kind of had their minimalist, formalist uh, uh, ways of looking at light and looking at the world. And you're getting out of the light as light and more of light as sculpture in a way. Well, it's a, it's a very ch it's a very challenging field uh, in a way it's, as an artist and it's probably all know we identify with the culture we identify with what's available and what can be used but that's not enough for an artist uh, the medium itself so I have to uh, go back also to what you're saying about the first pioneers in life uh, because they actually, I think they had it harder than me in a way, <laughs> trying to get the medium accepted in the field of art. And uh, Dan Flavin looking at the light fixture, which is what it is, it's the object itself that matters, and then looking at James Turrell, which he works with indirect light, diffused light, using the space to absorb that light and, and, and move it through the space in a certain way. Um, so in the present, uh, a big field for me, it's that open up, it's the installation art, uh, and it's also the new technologies. Not all of them are available, and I keep an eye on them. What can I do, when can I do it, and for what purpose? Uh, but I have to be uh, relying on different materials to be able to say this medium um, in itself, it's, it's enough, but it's not enough. Um, I, I identify with the light movement, but on the same time I'm debating with myself, there are other materials like plastics and 3D printed materials I know that I'm uh, playing with that can be sculptural and can be light. So it has two faces in a way, my sculptures, and I always say that, and uh, I always get a direct response towards it is a light sculpture. And it's still a sculpture if it's not plugged in. <laughs> it's just a, it's a sculpture that uses light. To enhance itself, yeah. to, to, to take the space. And that's where the discussion in the installation now comes. Because it's not, uh, it's not contained with the dead material. It has a presence in the room or the environment in which it sits that creates it more or brings it into installation art. And in terms of your works being sculptures or still kind of having a presence even if the light isn't on, <laughs> one of the things that I like about new media work, which we'll get to how light still classifies as new media a little later, but um, is that if people buy your work and choose to bring it into their home, they have to make really conscious decisions about it, whether to leave it on indefinitely until a bulb runs out or they have to decide if they want to turn it on or off yeah. in a single day or for a single time, or, oh, I'm having a party or I'm having people over, so I should turn this on, even though it hasn't been on in a week. And I want to know how you think about the collectors that <laughs> end up with your work or your friends that end up with your work and how that kind of responsibility is different than buying a painting and having it hang on the wall and only having to look at it and not think about if you actually want to activate the artwork or not. Because it's a completely different uh, type of responsibility to have as a collector or as an appreciator mm -hmm. of art also. Well, the first thing I want to say, and I have several ideas here, and I love to talk about this subject a lot. Um, one is, we are in a consumer society. <laughs> Everything is consumable, nothing is permanent. Uh, I would like to be that Renaissance man doing the marble, but I don't think it's we are there in the art. So first of all, if collectors purchase my work, collect my work, they collect uh, an idea first. They con It's a concept, more than the object. That's how I think, that's how I portray myself. Uh, some collectors will buy work that know it's consumable as you look at it, including paper, when it's exposed to certain um, but, you know, environment. But these are very <laughs> resistant, actually, materials, and that's where I'm... Well, yeah, I'm you're, dealing, go. you're dealing with plastics, materials that don't break down in the yes. environment, so yeah. in a way, dealing with an archival issue of your sculptures, it's kind of a non-starter, that conversation, because they're materials that are going to be around for 
longer than you or I. Yes. Yes, th this is the type of the material. But it seems somehow that life goes to this stage where people think, oh, well, okay, what if it's, it's just a light bulb? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or it's just a certain material that uh, can be replaced easy. And I'm very conscious about how to leave instructions or even participate uh, when it's needed. Oh, okay, you just pull it out there or you just, you know, replace the light bulb. So I'm, I'm making it very easy. Uh, even though I like to complicate things, and sometimes I have collectors who like that complicated part. Actually, uh, there was a piece here, if you remember uh, in Mandragora show, the liquidant light, uh, the computer uh, uh, water cooling system, moving the water through it with mm -hmm. the uh, ultrasonic foggers inside. Basically, the maintenance of that piece, I, I told immediately in the preview party, uh, to the collectors that uh, it's like uh, having a fish tank in the house. And uh, I wasn't sure I want to sell it first. I was like, this is just cool. I want it in the show, but it was just, I know. It was, that was the first piece that was sold. <laughs> 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 and they love doing that. I just talked to them recently. They love having, you know, good care of it. Well, that's, it, as being a collector and engaging with your art is such a, kind of normally a singular relationship because it's standing and looking at your painting or standing and looking at your drawing, but pieces like your pieces or other pieces that Anya sells that are like video works, it's that different engagement because if you're watching a video work, you have to make the commitment to watch a video work. Or if you need to clean out your piece like a fish tank, anyone who's <laughs> ever had or had to clean out a fish tank knows the kind of insane responsibility that that takes and the time that it really takes. It's It's like showing a true love and appreciation for an artwork. Exactly. And and, and I like that. I like the fact that uh, there are collectors who are very committed to that. And I like also people who will say, well, I want less maintenance so easy. Just want to change the battery on the remote control. And that's fine. Uh, and, and I do, I'm very honest about from the beginning, which piece is that, like the outdoor piece. If outdoor can rain on it, right? I'm not going to say put that in the rain, even though the plastics that I've been 3D printing, they are for outdoors. Uh, I, I want for the strongest, most resistant material. Um, the new technology in LED actually is very good and it's getting better. Brighter and longer hours, so it's between 50,000 hours and 100,000 hours. Uh, depending on the usage, like you say, if you decide to keep it on or not keep it on, you can have it 20, 30 years easy. That's where the materials, the longevity of these lights can go. Uh, it really depends on, on the collection. Since you brought up this piece, could we talk a little bit about it? Because it's, I would say it's the most different from all the others in the show, and it's also kind of a newer technology that you've been dipping your toe into. The, um, the white piece, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this piece uh, was installed, I believe, without the light because of power source issues uh, in the Heights, on oh, the yeah. Heights Promenade <laughs> in Houston, uh, just up the street, actually. Um, so it's metal, what kind of metal is it? Uh, it's steel. It's steel, so it, it's powder-coated steel, which means it also, in a different way than the plastics, it has an outdoor longevity that could really outlast many things. So can you talk about why you're kind of venturing into metals <laughs> and how that might affect the larger scale projects that you do? Because you do do temporary and uh, permanent public art pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, with this piece, this was uh, for Houston Heights. Um, I was invited to do something there in the middle, and I was so excited about the whole project until I found out there is no plug or cord to bring. There is no electricity. <laughs> so uh, I put uh, solar panels, and I had some white lights in it. I couldn't have the solar panel with the color changing. It was too uh, complicated for that uh, project. But uh, I. The concept is still the same with the nature and the glaciers and the melting glacier, and I thought it would be beautiful to have a melting glacier in the heights. <laughs> so that's where it came uh, for outdoors. But uh, it was a challenge, I, I have to say, that I took for myself, and for many years I promised myself I would work more for outdoors. There are many more opportunities in public artwork for outdoors than for indoors. I know 90% are listed for outdoors, but <laughs> indoor is just beautiful and it can be more beautiful and um, easier to, uh, to, you know, have a variety of, uh, of sculptures. Uh, but I took the challenge and I uh, had this laser cut it with a fabricator. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't, I don't have the laser car in my garage yet. <laughs> and then I brought it back to my garage and I welded it from inside out. Uh, being, being able to be in the sculpture so it can be powder for you on the inside was very really important as well. So I couldn't make it too small and narrow. And uh, I gave it back for powder coating to, to the fabricators. And uh, I'm, I'm just still, I think I'm very in love with it. I don't know why I'm so in love with this piece. <laughs> Without light, it looks like it's um, origami made out of paper. It looks delicate. And it has, and if you bump into it and all of that, it's strong and, you know, it's, it's a strong resistant piece. And, uh, we're also making a funny joke. I have to say, I love it when, when Anya said, like, you're so preoccupied with the weather and the environment and you made a weather resistant piece. <laughs> so I thought it was beautiful because I didn't think about it that way, but it did impact me. How can I do artwork? That actually can resist in this extreme environment. It can be very hot, it can be very windy, it can be cold. It's just, and it can be dirty too, you just can wash it. <laughs> the wind blows on it and the, cold, the particles, they just, it cleans very easy with the hose. I feel like probably one of the reasons that it made you so excited is because you are, <laughs> a, a lot of your work really comes down to materials. A lot of it is about tactility, or in this piece, it's almost kind of like the lack of tactility because it's polished and it looks delicate and it looks like you can't touch it. Whereas the pieces like this, like I don't know about y'all, but I just want to get up into it because it's so, I mean, it's so, it's scrumptious is a weird word for something <laughs> like this, but in a, in a weird way, it is scrumptious. It's like a, it's like a weird hairy monster. The, the pink piece in the corner also, you kind of want to hug it. It's bodily. It's, <laughs> perfectly sized. It's a way for you to interact with it, again, on a different level. So I could see the new material being really appealing in that way because it's materials kind of come down to the heart of what you're doing because, yeah, you're looked at as light artist, but it's, it's a sculpture. It's materials. And it's a tough material. Uh, I don't think a lot of metal sculptures allow so much flexibility. That's why I was it took me a while to get to this point because I like different materials. I like that flexibility. I like having options. And this is more restrictive. And in order to keep everything consistent with my work and be happy with what I, I, I that, that's why it was a challenge. I think I worked on this one more than like on the entire show, producing the entire show that was labor intensive in, in, in so many ways. And it's, I, I guess, um, it's a competitive thing in me as well. <laughs> okay. How, what do you mean by competitive? Because, How competitive? Because, because metal and sculpture is so masculine, I have to prove myself <laughs> like to that level. Even though I prove myself in many other levels in sculpture and installation art and painting and everything, I just had to, to do it for the outdoors. And I still want to continue, but still to maintain my own style, personality, and not lose that innocence and vibrancy of the material just because it's been used and can be used in different forms. So, it, I don't know, it's just one of those things I'm like, <laughs> I'm so glad well, it happened and it came out really good. Well, in talking about proving yourself in a way also, and contrasting with this piece, you've done a number of public pieces. Um, I, I know I'm very familiar with the one that you did at George R. Brown Convention Center for the Texas Contemporary Art Fair okay. a couple of years ago. Uh, the piece that was up, is it still up at uh, Houston First? No, that uh, was uh, for the Pride Month last year in the summer. Okay, yeah, so at kind of early to mid-2018, a piece like right in Discovery Green in front of the new George R. Brown. Um, there's the permanent art piece that you have on uh, up right now at Texas Tech. And all of these, or at least mainly the Georgia Brown uh, interior piece and the Texas Tech Public Commission, which is also indoors, it lends itself to a different way of working because it's having to deal with a large environment and it's having to deal with a lot of different challenges, which are light sources, actual people that you can't maintain like an art gallery, so you can't control people in a way <laughs> in the terms of how they Students. interact. Um, because like you said, people want to touch your sculptures. Um, so I want to know how you think about approaching those public pieces and how you think about the space and how that really influences you. Because 
I know in, when our conversation when we were talking earlier, you like doing the small scale pieces, but you really relish in working big. Yeah. I always start with a big space or a big installation, uh, and then I reduce it down to a wall uh, or a pedestal piece. I always start big. I have to see the space. For me, it's very important to know the location where I'm going and what's going to happen in that location because installation art is very dependent on the architecture of the building and also on what kind of environment, uh, especially with public work, there are so many personalities. I'm not talking about the selection committee, which are mostly like 20 people from different disciplines. I'm talking also about being in a, 